Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ahmed Al Adawi. Uh, I have a computer science background and a master's degree in Internet of Things. So I'm a tech guy. Uh, such a snowing weather needs a hot drink. So if I place this coffee into on, on my arm, I feel it hot and I move my arm down. And that's basically because of the nervous system connected all the way to my brain and my brain processes these signals and recognize it as a hot surface. So the question here is, what if that part of the brain that is responsible for my thermal sensation is not interesting? No? Raise your hand if you say no. If you say yes. Um, well, um, I think I would, uh, I would feel uncomfortable. Sorry, I was going to change the environment. So you agree that your reaction won't be the same. You won't, you won't leave yeah. it. So that's why we have, again, if I take both of these chairs, let's say that one is the carer and that one is the patient. So the patient has different thermal perception compared with the carer. Not only thermal perception, but I'm just concentrating on my research into air quality and thermal perception. So there is a gap. Knowing that both of them live in the same environment. So how can we create an environment for both of them, knowing that both of them have different indoor comfort perceptions? Is is my research. Next slide. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so this is my research gap, different thermal and indoor environmental perceptions between people with dementia and their caregivers indoors. Let's, let's say some numbers here. So in the UK alone, there are 16 million people age 65 and above, nearly 850,000 people diagnosed with dementia. And 80% 80, 80 of that number lives in their own homes. So they don't live in like uh, care homes or so. So we want to come up with a solution for these people that can be adopted indoors in their own homes and can can solve that problem. So people with dementia and their caregivers have if different indoor perceptions compared to normal adults. On the other hand, the needs for design guidelines for a dementia-friendly home is growing because most of these people live in their own homes. Uh, that's why the aim of my research is to develop a general uh, design advice on the design and operation of homes for people with dementia and their carers, which increase the independence and offer high levels of activities. So we've highlighted the problem. And if we see here, a lot of research has been uh, done, different seasons, summer, mid seasons and winter. And we can see like the optimal temperature for people with dementia in winter in China range between like 14 and 19 degree. If you compare that number in the UK, it's 22.7. So they're not the same. If we want to create an indoor environment, we have to consider these differences. Knowing that these people have been living in that climate zones for quite a long time. In other words, their bodies adapted to that environment for that uh, for a certain amount of time, a long time. Uh, that's why we can see it's the optimal temperature in China is, is lower compared to the UK in winter. In the UK, based on my review, I found that the optimal, so for thermal comfort and the air quality, thermal comfort consists of indoor temperature, relative humidity, and the air speed. 
for the air quality, I'm concentrating with the CO2 level. So this table illustrates the optimal uh, indoor environmental barometers for people with dementia and their caregivers just in the UK. We found that the optimal temperature is 23.3 to 26, compared by 17 to 19 by uh, the normal or the caregivers, normal people. The rate of humidity, 45 to 65, compared by 40 to 60. So people with dementia prefer higher level of uh, relative humidities. Whereas the CO2 and the air speed uh, is quite, quite common between the, car, between the caregiver and the patients. So as lower these values are, as the optimal environment would be. Uh, so as I said, I'm a tech guy. I can't come up with a cure for their disease. I can't even control the onset of their dementia, but I do can control the environment around them. And that's where IoT, Internet of Things, comes in. So for those who don't know, IoT is a set of sensors and actuators connected to each other to sense and share data to perform a specific task. So how can I use that concept to solve us this problem? Okay, what kind of sensors do I need? What kind of data do I have to gather? As I said, uh, here, temperature, relative humidity, CO2, and the uh, air velocity. Okay, what are the actuators? What are the things that I have to control indoor to control the thermal comfort? Any idea? Heaters, what else? Windows, doors, right? Okay, so I'm proposing a control system that identifies the activity of the patient in law and activate the comfort settings attached with that activity. Because I believe to achieve that optimal environment, we have to identify the activity because people spend 90% of their time indoors doing different types of activities. And I do believe that each activity has its own comfort, comfort settings. So we have to predict the activity first, then we have to activate the comfort settings for that predicted activity. So quickly, Three activities, sleeping, cooking, and exercising. Of course, more activities can't be integrated, but for the sake of simplicity, we're just concentrating into uh, these three. We, start, we will start taking the readings from the sensors and identify the location of these readings and compare it with these activities. We can note that uh, these activities happen in three different places. Once we predict the activity, we can, uh, we can activate the comfort settings, like open the window, close the door, to achieve that optimal ranges for, for that patient. That control system would be in, tested and installed in two dementia-friendly homes. Luckily, we have one here in Loughborough, 211 Ashby Road, and the other one here in, uh, in Watford, a BRE dementia-friendly home. So for experiments, will be running, or actually I'm running my first experiment now uh, in that house to, to validate the proposed, the proposed control system. Uh, I'll be talking about my first experiment at the, at the last slide. But for the second experiment, we're designing uh, an exercise, some exercises that improve the capability of the patients. I'm doing a game to encourage these people to interact with that exercise to do these, these movements. Okay. For the sensors, as I said, indoor temperature, relative humidity, CO2 concentrations at the air speed. And this picture is for the sensor that I will be using. I'm using Dantic, Dantic uh, uh, Comfort uh, sensors. So we can see here, this one is the relative humidity. These three are the air speed, and this one is the uh, temperature. 
for the actuators, as I said, door actuators. We've got some videos here. So once we identify the activity, we can send a signal to open or close that door. That this is a door actuator. I'll do it. Okay. Window actuator. Two different types of uh, operations will be integrated. So automatic and manual. The, if the patient is uh, confident enough to control the system, then the system would, would give the control to the patient. Otherwise automatic control would be activated. So that window actuator, opening and closing. And curtains as well. I believe that this system, once we validate uh, that system with our experiments, would uh, not only save the cost of the dementia in the UK, but only provide people with dementia with the optimal environment that they deserve, but it's going to be a small step forward in bringing them back to their normal lives. Thank you so much. And before I take any question, I want to, uh, to invite you, if, uh, if you are over 40 or, or above, to participate and interested in my dementia research, to participate in this experiment. So this experiment is running now in 211 Ashville also, if you're based in Bafra and happy to participate in dementia research, then please scan this QR code or, or this link, and I'll be happy to, to, uh, for you to, uh, to participate. Thank you so much, and I will come back soon. How does it, your brief was to talk about BPSD as related to thermal uh, environments and indoor environments. So how, uh, you know, you talked about your experiments, which is, which is great, but how does this relate to the things that Tom talked about, like the agitation, the apathy, and so on? So as I said, I'm concentrating in the four different parameters, the indoor temperature, yes. the relative humidity, the airspeed and uh, the CO2 concentration. Mm -hmm. So starting from the temperature, we know that higher temperature and lower temperature affects the patients. For example, uh, higher temperature values, and that values can be different from patient to patient, can uh, cause a headache, uh, can affect the breathing for, for the patient. For higher values in relative humidity, can uh, can make them uh, uh, can increase the cough and uh, make them the thermal discomfort. Lower values of relative humidity can can affect their vision, make dry eyes, and make make the skin dry. For the CO two concentration, if it's high, especially where they're sleeping. They, they affect their sleep quality. Yep, that's, that's it to answer the question. And, and would create more apathy perhaps and yeah. agitation. Yeah. Is there anything in the literature that you uh, read about that? Oh yeah, uh, so I've created a literature uh, review and uh, we have uh, received an invitation to, to publish that literature, the literature uh, as a chapter in the mission design book. So if anyone is interested, I would, I would be happy to share that into uh, the with you. Yeah. Yep. Um, go ahead. Sorry. So I was just going to say, would you mind repeating the question before you answer it? Uh, okay. You yeah, just the microphone. Read the microphone. So just, just hang on to the microphone, just repeat the question. So um, it's an interesting subject. I was wondering about what's known about temperature preferences in general in sort of in the, in the population as a whole. So we were having a bit of a joke about the difference between men and women in terms of temperature preference. Uh -huh. um, but do we, know, do we know anything about gender? Do we know anything about people's day-to-day -day variability in their preferences? Um, and do we know anything about, is there a change with time of day as well in terms of what people prefer? Uh -huh. 
So Prof. Tom asked whether there is temperature differences varies uh, during the day yeah. and based on gender, male and female. So the answer is yes. And we were considering actually here, uh, I've included the male and females. So we know that uh, based on gender, their optimal thermal comfort level varies. And uh, I know that women prefer slightly more temperature and they're more sensitive that compared with, uh, with male. Uh, uh, for day to day, to day activity, Yes, and I think Prof. Eve uh, highlighted in her paper, uh, uh, dementia person now that people with dementia have different modes even on the same day. So the answer is yes, both of them are. Well, whether that's a fact by the end or environment, of course, and your preference, I, I think that's because as you, I, I don't know, you know, when, you, when you're staying up late at night and you're working on a paper and it's two o'clock and you realize suddenly it is two o'clock because you're getting really, really cold, your temperature, your body temperature, your core temperature is going down. Now, have you come across anything in the literature that sort of uh, relates to that? Um, uh, Professor Tom Dedding uh, mentioned the night wandering. Um, could it be is that people are cold or because they prefer a higher temperature? Could that stimulate this agitation? Is there anything known about that? Yeah, so for the sleeping? Uh-huh. Yep, so as is for that control system, it considers these variation as activities. Mm -hmm. So each activity has its comfort settings, comfort values. For the sleeping, for example, we, uh, we know that the optimal CO2 level for people with dementia while sleeping is uh, 1800 ppm. And that, that's quite a challenge to, to stabilize that environment in such a value, especially if the windows and doors are closed. So how can we, we once we know that optimal temperature for that or optimal values for that patient, how to make that environment stable, that value is, is a challenge. Because if we open up the window, the temperature would, would decrease in the, in the winter, for example. So that's like how to stabilize these values while the patient, without affecting the patient's comfort, is a challenge I have to face. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so Amanda. much. And uh, we have a great uh, coffee and pictures of urn wasn't working, but we kind of kept on so don't eat some coffee.